My name's Mark Nash and I'm an author. Uh, I'd like to extol the virtues of a form of writing called flash fiction. Now if you haven't heard of that you're in good company because about four years ago I'd never even heard of it either, let alone written any. So to start with the definition, it's quite simple. It's uh, defined by word limit. Uh, usually a thousand words or less is a flash fiction story, though you will see definitions of 500 words or less, 800 words. Uh, there's also microfiction versions of that where it's sort of 75 words or a story in 100 words or less, which is called a drabble for some such reason. Um, the, the most famous example perhaps is the writer Ernest Hemingway, who was challenged to tell a story in six words, and he wrote the following. For sale, baby shoes, never worn. I think uh, flash fiction has sort of started to come to people's notice recently because uh, it's ideal for digital reading, reading online. Uh, if you think about 500 to uh, 1,000 words is about the same length as a good blog post. Uh, it's convenient for reading on tablets, on phones, so it's very good for, for commuter reading, reading on the go. And this is why I think it's, it's sort of grown in popularity and visibility. Um, but what I really like about it as a writer is that the opportunities that it offers you for uh, doing something a bit different in, uh, in writing. Um, with a thousand words or less, uh, you don't have any room for uh, wastage, for sort of uh, grandiloquent writing. Um, so language becomes very important. You have to get the right words. You know, you have to nail an image. You don't have time for, for sort of long introductions. You don't have time for grand descriptions of things. So you have to get right to the meat of it. So, as I say, language is very important, but even more than that, I think is it enables you to tell stories in different ways. Um, now, Hemingway's six-word version, I'm not sure if it's a story in the sense of a, a beginning, and a middle, and an end, because there's no sort of movement of time. He's only got six words. I mean, they can't be. Uh, and I think that's illustrative in that you can tell stories which aren't necessarily about beginnings, middles and ends. Uh, for example, a type of story that uh, I write quite a bit is where I take a central image or a theme and it's like sort of looking at a, a, a diamond or a gem where you use all the different facets and you're sort of turning it slightly different angles so that the light shines in a different way, illuminating it in a different way. So there is a sort of a narrative development because you're sort of looking at the the image in different ways and it's it's got the coherence and the, and the unity of being about that same image that same theme but it's not moving on in terms of a beginning and middle end it's moving on in terms of different shades of light it's sort of like an impressionist painting really so what I'd like to do uh, today is uh, read 11 stories that I've written um, with a bit of preamble uh, before each one uh, about the different type of story that it's it's telling whether it's language related or whether it's this sort of facet thing or something else um, but also to give you an indication of where it came from uh, because flash fiction if you're writing one a week for the various uh, flash fiction uh, websites you have to come up with a lot of material so the notion of a prompt is very important you know wh where do these stories come from what prompts them how can you sort of turn around a story in a week so I give uh, where some of those stories originated. And this first one is called While You Were Sleeping. And it's an example of what I was saying of, of that sort of um, gemstone facet thing. Uh, the central image is just the idea of seeing someone else asleep uh, on, the, uh, on the bed beside you. Uh, now that could be a, a newborn baby that you bring home from the hospital and you sort of that first night and you're watching over it. And it's also new and terrifying. Uh, it can be watching over someone who's ill that you're by their bedside tending them. Or it could, of course, be watching a lover who's, who's fallen asleep, but you're still awake and still sort of, you know, flushed with love and all those sort of good feelings. So this first one is called While You Were Sleeping. Your first night on earth was held under my eyes, swaddled among blankets in your Moses basket like a tortilla wrap. Your breath so fragile, I could detect no trace of it, which served only to quicken my own throughout the long hours. Your alabaster lid so transparent, the shadow of your eyes beneath was visible. You were wholly still, save for the flinch of your startle reflex. What dreams could you have had less than 24 hours on earth? Or ones brought with you from my womb, no doubt, rhythmic, liquid dreams. And somehow you soon migrated from the basket to my bed. For my ease of feeding you as much as your own insistent neediness. 
how I was too terrified to go to sleep and roll my weight on top of you. So I watched you instead. My eyes accustomed themselves to the scanty light. Your dreams are now attended by little whimpers from your mouth, and I could see your chest rise and fall with your strong heart. Was I yet in your dreams, or was it only my breast which figured? Whichever of the two, were we glorious to you, or monstrous? And when finally you were decanted from my nipple into a bed of your own, I would read you magical stories to convey you into slumber. Always I would linger by the bed and continue to marvel at your seeming contentedness. Retiring happily ever after to my own bedroom next door, I never once heard you cry out in your repose. Peaceful, agreeable dreams seemed to be the order of your night, and thereby I dropped off contented myself. Oftentimes I snuck in under cover of night, in the guise of Santa Claus or Tooth Fairy, leaving you gifts while you slept on unknowingly yet expectant. An exchange of milk and biscuits or tooth for bulges in the stocking at the head of the bed or under your pillow, waiting, suspending my breath until your twisted frame was positioned just right so as to grant me access to slip the offerings under you. Though no follower of religion, Yet in those moments you looked like an angel, and my leavened soul floated up to the ceiling. At those times when you were struck down by childhood diseases, how I maintained a tender vigil by your side, mopping your brow with a damp cloth, trying to contain and drive down your inner heat, catching the blocked cadences of your breath, tracking its forced entry through your mouth watching your pinched features as you struggle to overcome the snags and snarls of a body turned against itself. Once you decamped to university, I occasionally still visited your bedroom, to be confronted with the crisp lines of the untouched linen and the dry smack of cold, uninhabited air. I cocked my ear for any of the various of your pulses I had matched to my own. Even when home for the holidays, there was that period when you cried yourself to sleep every night over a girl. With me stood outside your door, head bowed against the wood, as torn apart as you at my redundancy. It came that time when I visited you in hospital after you'd been knocked off your bike. Your arm was in plaster and braced in a harness. How we joked about your involuntary salute and that the steel rod holding it together might set off metal detectors in airports, sparking shakedown searches. But it hurt you to laugh. Pushing spluttering air through mangled ribs, I could see the soreness etched across your face in spite of the analgesic deadening. But I ached too, as I thought of you travelling to far-flung parts of the world. In the end, the pain would exhaust you into an uneasy and throbbing sleep. I looked on over you, and the years fell away as we resumed our mutual stations, albeit until the overseeing nurses asked me to vacate the ward, since visiting time had expired. And now it is you who sits at my bedside, and though I can no longer detect you. I'm unclear if my eyes are open or not, but they are assuredly unseeing. My breathing, too, is irregular, as straining not to the pulse of my heart, but to lungs toiling out of synchronicity, sometimes shallow breath, sometimes deeper, and scrambling after every possible variant patterned after yours, as I try and reach out for the last time to fall into conjunction with your start stout heartbeat here and now. But I can't hear it. Are you even in here with me? I sense that you are. I think you may be holding my hand maybe softly purring words at me, but I can't tell. If you are, it is you who is awake, and I am the one asleep. I can hear one thing, however, deeply recessed in the back of my barely functioning brain, the sounds of wings flapping. I always said you were an angel. Um, this next one is uh, an example of the type of story that uh, relies entirely on its language, on the idiom, which in this case is uh, the calls of bingo callers. They're sort of rhyming couplets for the numbers. Um, and it's a story that proceeds uh, without sort of paragraph structure. Uh, and yet there is definitely um, a sort of progression of narrative. It's a sort of call and response. This is called 
The caller to the bingo caller's house calls house. Time for fun! 41! There are 41 paving stones in the footpath from your front gate. Key of the door! 21! Your wallet has a combined total of 21 credit, debit and membership ID cards. Clickety click! 66! As usual, there will be a total of 66 prizes given out by you down at the bingo tonight. Everyone's a winner, of sorts. A gateway to heaven, 27! The staircase up to the bedroom is composed of 27 steps. Dancing Queen, 17! The 17th stairboard is loose and groans, so take pains to avoid it. One more time, 79. There are 79 books in your bookshelf on the landing. Naughty 40. All your light bulbs are 40 watt energy savers. Makes your house rather dismal. Knock at the door, four. In her sleep, your wife snores four times before a whistle. A pick and mix, 26. The bedroom door is 26 inches wide. I have to turn side on to squeeze through it. Candy's breakfast, 80. Your wife has 80, yes, count them, 80 dresses in the wardrobe. Coming of age, 18. She has 18 different beauty creams, ointments and salves on her bedside table. Up to tricks, 46. And there are 46 minutes until the last game at the end of your shift. You and me, number three. Your wife sleeps propped up on three pillows. One fringed. On its own, one. And now that I'm here, she can no longer be said to be all alone. Dirty Gertie, number 30. We all know your wife isn't called Gertie. Candy Store, 74. She isn't called Candy either. She's not American. Rise and Shine, 29. The and Me, 23. Down on Your Knees, 43. Droopy Draws, 44. Ask for More, 34. Red Raw, 64. Staying Alive, 85. Get Up and Run, 31. House. Eyes down. Clean the floor. 54. Um, this next one is a story that doesn't have any human characters in it at all. Um, and it was prompted by, I was uh, at my local underground station, uh, which is actually above ground. And I was just looking at the view from the raised platform back down on street level. And uh, this is what I saw, uh, albeit uh, slightly embellished with a bit of poetic license. This is called The Forsaken. Every town has one, or one at the very least, a patch of unhallowed ground, some forlorn stretch of shattered tarmac, the pocked marked wasteland. Terrain once staked out by man, now seeded by him, bereft of signature jetsam, the condoms, syringes and empty rotgut bottles indicative of an agonised withdrawal. Yet within an urban jungle, nature seldom makes so bold as to reassert her dominion. Derelictions removal men, seemingly having thrown petrifying dust sheets over these fixtures and ill fittings. The mosaic of the pulverised concrete, akin to the pebble dash cast of the surrounding building walls, as if the scene has been turned on its side. Even rootless litter appears to have been nailed down in permanent display. Blown from pillar to post, this particular spot has been deemed Refuse's final blotching place. A potter's field for the non-biodegradable, devoid of potters and any living organism at all. All notionally delimited by the chain-link fence. But the border is indeterminate, for the fence has been trampled down. The negative space between the twisted metal links presents the only barrier now. A bayonet reeds jutting through these apertures. Chlorophyll halberdiers, braided with nettles and brambles, sagging under the armoury of barbs and thorns. 
supper tripwires, for where no feet ever tread. A tributary nature's token conscription, all present and correct, yet unable to advance any further. Held in suspended animation, just like the metal and brick all around. There's no nourishment to be derived here. Wooden pallets charred from hosting obsolete fires. All colour long bled into their black hearts. Yet still this is not the predominant hue tugging the eyes at apprehension. Jagged scars of livid brown rust uncannily funnels all sight lines. Oil drums, drain pipes, corrugated roofs, each a corroded excremental brown. Shed flakes like metal dandruff speckles the ground. A brick building with entrance boarded up and all its windows put through. Thick gobbets of crystallised glass, a sheet laminate atop the torn up concrete. A razor wire lines the low roof. Strips of fabric and plastic bags snagged on its barbs ought to billow in the disdainful draughts, but they too are pinioned fast. Aloft the building, a boxy metal housing, an air conditioning unit or electrical generator. Here, where nothing respires, nor is any drawing of energy invoked. The caged blades are fossilised like silted anchors dredged from sea wrecks. Clamped to the building's walls, some outsized toy duct piping, terminating in a chimney of simple geometric lines, a scaled-down version of a watchtower at Auschwitz. In amongst all this stasis, there is yet one outpost of movement. At the very verge of vision, something flips, f flaps fitfully, with just the faintest of feathery deviation from the rigid and the upright. Playing breeze-borne peekaboo from behind an unencumbered fence post is a bouquet of cut flowers, desiccated, mummified, and lifeless like everything else in this rubblescape. A fitting tribute to that other importation, the murdered little boy dumped here yesterday, today, or last month. The forsaken living memory here can't quite recall. Every town has one. One at the very least. Uh, this next one is an example of what I was saying earlier, how stories don't have to have beginnings, middle, ends, because uh, this is entirely made up of endings. Um, in Hollywood, whenever a director is, uh, wants to disown their film because of studio interference or too much influence of the major star, uh, they appeal to the Directors Guild uh, of America to have their name removed. And what happens is, or what used to happen, is that the name Alan Smithy used to um, be inserted in the credits as director. Uh, but gradually people cottoned on to the fact that if Alan Smithy's name appeared under the director uh, credits that the film was like to be a turkey. Um, so the practice still goes on, but they don't use the name Alan Smithy anymore. I think they use lots of different var variants of the name. Anyway, this is called A Series of False Endings. The emergency sirens were getting closer. The mob with their torches were raising their flambeaux in exultation, but saw them extinguished by the hovering helicopters looking for a place to land. The soldiers in fatigues were deploying and handing out blankets. The ticker tape parade was in full swing, though once the confetti landed on the concrete sidewalk, they were limply drenched by the hoses putting out the ground fires. The tribal warrior was taking the plaudits from his people as he rode by them in his chariot. The girl kissed the man who had rescued her death-defyingly, though he flinched as her lips irritated the cut on his. Meanwhile overhead, pyrotechnics lit up the sky with celebratory swashes of colour. Their detonations blotted out the sound of horns from the flotilla of ships returning triumphantly to harbour. The graduates threw their mortarboards up in the air, while on the parade ground the police received their medals with due pomp. He shouldn't have been quite so churlish, disowning his own film because the studio rejected his dark ending. Their test screenings, focus groups and guinea pigs, people who never made a film in their life, YouTube notwithstanding, had plumped for something more upbeat. And so he had ceded his opus to Alan Smithy, the hardest working director in Hollywood back in the day. Out of peak, he had spiced together a reel of all the hackneyed endings to films he could find, and now sat watching it on an endless loop, his own original celluloid having long since shriveled into dust. He who'd been charged with chronicling the world through his imagination, now left without a camera to record anything, just a projector to relay this degraded version of it instead. Here in his self-enforced seclusion, 
now the last witness to the fate of mankind. Following the ravages of wars and genocides, the inundations of toxic waste, a biological mutation and terrorist-inspired nuclear contamination, rising tidal waters and tsunamis, the assault of solar radiation through the Earth's denuded Maginot line of ozone and magnetic fields. The last man on Earth, one of its most eloquent examiners, stripped of any means of self-expression, of any audience remaining to report to. There were no focus groups now. He wound the spool of film around his neck and looped it over the curtain rail. Alan Smithy's final stand as he kicked the best supporting chair away from under him. The definitive ending that his magnum opus had demanded all those years ago, but which had been prettified by the studio. If anything, he hadn't been dark enough in the original. Um, this next one is, uh, again, is, uh, relies entirely on its language. Uh, in this case, it's where words start to break down and mutate into other words. And yet the, uh, the sense and the understanding still is fully accessible, at least I hope it is. Um, this is called Just Aphasia Going Through. The doctor points out the bubble-like alien parasiting my brain. It looked like an embryo was growing there, a second me, swiping a second-hand consciousness. Paying me neither rent nor mind, yet taxing me a tithe of my cells. The bare-faced cheek of it. Tide not shaved in months now. To my deluded pain receptors, the razor felt like it was scooping up the inside of my skull. At this okay shun, the doctor indicated that the tumours were now squatting against the language centres of my brain, a journeying to the centre of me. I say squatting, squat trusting may be more opposite. I mean opposite. I mean, I don't know what I mean. I'm less than whole. These days find I can't finish my sentences. I used to finish those of others in my eagle anticipation to understand them. I was ignoring like that. Ignoring? A shoe on the other boot now. The ironing being others have to guess my words to figure out what I'm trying to slay. This thing will owe the death of me, though there will owe no me to speak of, since I would have longing surrendered any bill utility to espresso myself. The memories will be longing lost, since I will lactate the romps recalling them. I will an empty, wordless shell, like cancel the crab, chew more up of me. That one I did on per possum. I'm not quiet shot put yet, not when I shot put what's left of my mind to it. They slay, I'm slurring my words. Languish is defecting me, splaying possum. My languish, my languish word be. Uh, this next one is uh, a story that, uh, again, sort of embodies that sort of um, facet, gemstone uh, thing of shedding different lights on the same central image uh, or theme. In this case, the theme was um, babies are supposed to be able to hear in the womb uh, their mother's voice or music that's played to them. And this is supposed to be very important for their development, which is fine, uh, all well and good. Uh, but it set me thinking, well, once the baby emerges into life, uh, and they hear their mother's voice and they hear the same music that they do recognise, but surely it sounds uh, qualitatively different because when they're in the womb they've got all these sort of membranes and, and other surfaces and tissues uh, sort of ref refracting the sound before it gets to them. Uh, this is called Strains. To wean me off from being propped nightly over my mother's familiar heartbeat, my parents suspended a musical mobile over my cot. Rather than conduct me to sleep, however, it merely set my gums on edge, later explained away as teething, since its lullaby sounded nothing like the sweet harmonies of my mother. But then, even when she sang while I clung to her stomach as we bathed together, that didn't sound quite how I was used to hearing her either. Perhaps it was the accentuating acoustics of the porcelain tiles. More likely it's because bath water couldn't replicate amnion as a modulating medium. One of my toy dollies taught, if you depressed her soft yielding stomach, out would come a limited refrain of sayings. When I put my hand to my own belly and spoke, the muscles there pushed against my hand and made the speech seemingly more urgent to emerge from my mouth. 
so I pressed my ear to the doll's waxy skin, hoping for her words to directly pour themselves into my ear. But she lacked for a skeleton or cartilage to reverberate, and thus her faux skin yielded me no secrets. The repeated pressure vainly applied to the doll's abdomen detached her voice box, and she refrained from speaking altogether. The subsequent talking dolls all operated with a pull cord. Their reedy, hollow utterances were always preceded by the whirring of the retracting wire. My grandmother's personal heirloom to me was an old musical box. Its tinny tones had been muted by age, but on accidentally removing the cover and exposing its innards, the volume increased in body. However, I became more involved in the works themselves. I used to love restraining the revolving brass cylinder, my fingers contesting with the pent-up tremulous energy of the motor. And better yet, to impede the tugged teeth of the comb, dulling their plucked peel. The most satisfying was to let the tiny pins embedded in the cylinder play over the pads of my fingers before they palpated the lamellae. Seeing the indented flesh and then watching it regain itself and the livid red pinpricks fade. The plasticity of my own skin accompanied the box's anthems. The trumpeting announcement of the ice cream van to our cul-de-sac signalled a rare retreat for me than the other kids. Yes, the mangled tones of green sleeves or some other vaguely recognisable melody sputtered through the air like an old emphysemic train, weaving a tuneless whistle. But rather than the pitch, I was interested in the separation of the notes one from another, as if each one had to be hand-cranked from whatever apparatus churned the chimes out through the van's loudspeaker. So unsteadily wavering and imprecise were their amplitudes that the sound upon the air couldn't in fact be located as emitting from any point at all, least of all the vehicle itself. And the distortion lingered there. Even on breezy days, there seemed no dispersing them, Rather, they billowed like laundry on the washing line. The rapturous screams of the kids slipped into its shrill slipstream and took on its unearthly tintinabulations. While I looked wistfully on from my bedroom window, seeing as my mother had forbidden me from ever buying an ice cream from the van, having heard that every two years or so, some child suffered from a food poisoning laid firmly at its door. My first trip to the theatre saw me beg to retreat from our best seats in the house. My mother grudgingly acquiesced, but during the intermission as I licked my luxurious ice cream, demanded of me as to why. I simply replied that the actors had deafened me as soon as they began booming out their lines. She explained how they were merely projecting their voices to the back of the stalls where we ourselves now sat. They trained themselves to speak from their stomachs and abdomens in order to reach us. I remembered my own experiments pressing against my abdomen, but that had only served to cut off my breath. I respected the actors considerably more after the interval. There was always a plethora of sound abounding when my mother was doing one of her keep fit videos in her perpetual striving to shed the weight of bearing me. The first was that the walls and door frames throughout the house shook as she pounded up and down on the lounge carpet. Then there were the squealing exhortations of the boxed and badly dubbed female voice from the TV speakers as she was fighting against the poorly syncopated beat of the music there to keep the tempo. And finally, Mother's own grunts and other involuntary protestations by her body against its exertions. When each ordeal of a session was over, Mother would shamble one-handed through her chores, clutching her stomach with the other, as if there was simply no wind left in her at all. She was like my wound-down musical box. And what of my father, a man who crept in and out of both the house and my life with barely a footfall? He brought me into his study, a room I'd never entered. There were egg boxes covering the entire wall. He explained these were a cheap way of soundproofing, which had been insisted upon by my mother for whenever he played his hi-fi in the room. And they must have been remarkably effective, since I never heard any sound escape into the belly of the house. I wonder whether they also protected his ears from her ground-quaking gyrations in the lounge. He announced that he wanted to record my voice on a wall-mounted cassette deck he'd secured from a music studio that was being decommissioned. He twiddled around with the recording levels and played back my test snippet. I was horrified by the hiss on the tape. It sounded like the pantomime audience during the baddie back at the theatre. Even though here I only had an audience of one, and he was concentrating hard with his own breath in abeyance. 
and protested my dread of the outcome. He purred that he could record with Dolby to minimise the hiss, but that its drawback was it compressed and flattened out all the recorded range too. I hadn't liked the sound of my own voice on the test anyway. It wasn't how I thought I sounded, how I heard myself speak. He laughed and said that was because this was the purest version of my voice I would ever be likely to hear. Again, as with the ice cream van, I couldn't pinpoint the precise location of the emergency siren. It was bouncing off the walls of the houses and breaking up horribly. Soon enough I could tell it was approaching from behind as I walked home. When it finally passed me, its bell almost shattered my eardrums. I saw it pull up outside my house. I sped up into a run. Apparently my mother had dragged herself along the lounge floor and managed to dial a one-handed, with her other hand clutching her stomach where a peptic ulcer had burst. My father was blissfully unaware, and shrouded away in his study, insulated from her agonies by his egg-boxed wall. My voice has barely risen above a whisper since. I didn't want it to come into contact anywhere near my tummy. I only yearned to feel the pulse of my mother's familiar breath, straining wordless secrets straight into my ear. Um, this next one was uh, prompted by uh, a real-life event in uh, Britain's last general election, when then Prime Minister Gordon Brown uh, had been doing a public appearance and was climbing back into his limo, uh, and he didn't realise that his uh, his mic was still on, and he was complaining to one of his aides, uh, why did you bring up that old woman? She's nothing but a bigoted old woman. Uh, and, of course, this was broadcast, uh, and he had to sort of go back and have tea with her the next day and apologise profusely. Um, and it just set me thinking, well, what happens if uh, politicians really were to express what they felt uh, openly? Uh, what kind of political campaign would that make for? This is called... Confessional, today is the first day of the rest of your life. He plucked the sheet from shrouding the birdcage. The minor bird still had its head tucked under its wing. At that time I said I had to drive to Leeds for a meeting. I was actually down the clap clinic getting a prescription. A mixture of drowsiness and not having been exposed to those particular words before meant that for once the bird didn't come back with a snappily inappropriate retort. He bounded up the stairs into the bedroom. His wife caught sight of him looming up in the dressing table mirror and turned to put up her arms to warn him away from her face pack. Undeterred, he gently cut the back of her skull and drew her forward so that their foreheads met. When I was 13, I caught a frog and pulled it to pieces out of some sort of perverse desire to see how it was made. He pulled away and she handed him one of her wet cotton wipes to remove the cream transferred to his brow. She put it down to the significance of this red letter day and offered a silent prayer it wasn't going to be like this for the next three weeks. Ensconced within the plush leather in the back of the limo, he levered himself forward as he depressed the tinted partition glass. The back of the driver hove into view. Any time the family au pair was out of the house, I would go to the laundry basket and take out a pair of her stockings and wrap them around my face and inhale. And just once I tried it around my neck and squeezed, but I'll admit, I got scared. Apart from a slight cocking of his head, measured by the tilt of the peak of his cap, the chauffeur managed dutifully to keep his eyes on the road. He pulled the sash cord and the curtains parted from the plaque. The applause from the old people's home residents was somewhat subdued by their arthritic venerability. But he wrought an even greater bewilderment when he informed them that not only had he smoked cannabis regularly in his younger days, he had most definitely inhaled. He had only died desisted from the happy habit when his dinner party circuit supplier had been caught and imprisoned. As he left the building, a wheelchair-bound lady winked at him, but it could conceivably have been a twitch. Perched on a soapbox to address a precision engineering factory shop floor, he opened his arms out wide in a gesture of embrace, and then he scissored them back into his chest, as he regaled them with details of stealing reams of paper and typewriter ribbons from his first office job, how he'd even managed to smuggle out one of the company's two VCR machines. The workforce then broke out into a riot of mockingly trying to lift their hundred-weight machine tools and Marmy trying to stretch their pockets over them. He turned rather helplessly to his ghost, who glared daggers at him. 
at the Police Federation, he blurted out that he'd launched surreptitious spitball after spitball from the observation deck of the Empire State Building and tried to imagine them landing on pedestrians below. At the children's hospice with the camera whirring, he leaned in close to a little girl hooked up to drips and told her he'd started drinking in pubs at 16 and his first X-rated movie was when he was 17. Her medication meant she fell back into slumber while he was talking. On the podium at Pride, he had that he'd loved taking his children to playgroup as he got to ogle all the breastfeeding mothers. At the Interface conference, he came clean about his gap year antics. All those interminable train journeys around Europe were spent playing gin Ronnie for money with his card novice travelling partner, whom he had just taught the game and therefore gradually cleaned out of traveller's checks. And a man replied that gambling was a sin. The rabbi stroked his beard and told him that he should go make recompense for the man, even 35 years later as it was now. A priest took him by the elbow and quietly inquired if he thought of converting to Catholicism. After all, it wasn't unheard of within his line of work. After the polls closed on election day, the country had revealed itself split right down the middle. Half the nation had welcomed his uncommon honesty as evidence of a man who could be tr trusted to tell it like it really is. But the landslide of support his strategists had anticipated was undoubtedly compromised by their man's unfathomable compulsion to confess anything, anywhere, at any time. And this had prompted a backlash coalition, ranging from those Dutch uncles aghast at his moral reprehensibility through those amateur psychologists, gauging that he had just too many character flaws to be depended upon for the pressures of high office, down to the pragmatists, who merely doubted his abilities at summits and treaties, given the lack of tact and diplomacy witnessed during the campaign. His now estranged wife fell into the first cohort of the naysayers. His intention to step down from the party, rather than contest the rerun election, was announced on his behalf since his aides couldn't be sure whether he would be overcome with the compelling urge to confess that retirement hadn't actually been his decision. Uh, I mentioned before about prompts, and um, I don't really use the sort of prompts that are available online, which can be like a picture or three suggested words to include uh, in your story. Um, there are all sorts of, of other prompts. Uh, the reason I don't really sort of follow them is because I find there are prompts in everyday life just by looking around me. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, I was coming home from work on the bus and I stepped off and on the grass verge was an abandoned woman's shoe. Uh, now you do see uh, abandoned shoes occasionally where the strap or the heel have broken, but this seemed in perfect, um, sort of perfect order. So um, that set off a whole train of associations and thoughts in my head in the short walk home. So my brain was just firing off all these sorts of questions and, and sort of theories about how it got there, whose it was, all that kind of thing. So I wanted to set that down as soon as I got home, but I wanted to preserve that, that um, the way that my brain was working, the sense of all these things were firing. It wasn't a linear progression like a detective following a trail of clues to get to one inescapable conclusion. It was just this sort of bombardment of thoughts, stray thoughts, cutting across others, some unfinished, others going one direction and veering off in another. So that's what I wanted to try and replicate in this story and it's called Lost Soul. Lone shoe on the grass verge, flat, black, cheap patent, three rhinestones by the toe, lone star, dainty, lady's shoe, lady's fingers, uh, okra's too stringy for me, the old woman who lived in a shoe on a shoestring budget, a Cinderella slipper among the broken glass, limping home in a solitary shoe. Light scuffing, slightly worn heel but perfectly wearable, a flat shoe not broke. Somebody in a fix, was she drunk when it slipped off? How else could she not notice? Maybe the other shoes around here somewhere. Some would-be local Imelda will see if she's down a pair. Just three for me, uh, trainers, Oxblood Dr Martins and leather uppers for weddings and uh, funerals down as both. Women buy new shoes that are different and men look to exactly replace what is worn out. Once my DMs had their air sole punctured by a nail. Fifty quid for a new pair. Doc Martin would turn in his grave if he knew his remedial footwear had now become a fashion item. But this is a slip-on, a quick escape into the outside world, shooing yourself out of the house, 
shoe like a pest. Anything but a shoeing. That Arab journalist who threw his shoe at a US president. The sole of the shoe has always been regarded as the lowest of the low. And with the dog shit around here, you can see why. Unlike the noble soul. And no shoes on in a mosque. Entering sacred ground. The mundane earth must be kept outside. And my mother operated a version of the same dirt anxiety. But hers was more born out of avoiding inconvenience. And feet unconfined by shoes are free to grow. Accordingly, I have unfeasibly large plates. And bigger than anyone else in the family and a bugger to buy shoes in my size. Only size seven shoes are arrayed in a shoe shop for display. Why sevens, I wonder? The shoes are arrayed outside a mosque. Sign of life and vibrant community. Solitary shoe here. Sign of loneliness and abandonment. Should I take it home with me? What, on the off chance, she should show up looking for it? Something deeply unsettling about abandoned shoes. Not always, I suppose. The shoes neatly cubbyholed at the bowling alley, like a human honeycomb. Trendy trainer adverts with the shoes strung over lamp posts and telegraph wires. A Mussolini hung from a lamp post. Ah, unconscious associations. A news footage of massacres and bomb atrocities. People shedding their footwear as they try and run. Or are blown to kingdom come, so that all that remains in contact with the earth is their shoe. Trying to bring a people to heal. Actually, now I come to remember as well, the Auschwitz Museum has a room filled to the ceiling with shoes. Just stacked willy-nilly to convey the sheer scale. The extirpation of a community in a race by their distressed leather. I hope the woman got home okay. Um, there's a thing called a lipogram, which is a piece of writing which leaves out a letter of the alphabet. And maybe the most famous uh, example of this was by a, a French writer called Georges Perec, who wrote a whole novel without use of the letter E, which is slightly ironic, uh, excuse me, there's four in his name, and I assume they, they appeared on the spine of the book. But anyway, uh, kudos to him, and particularly to his translator into English, for uh, preserving that. Uh, I don't know if it's harder to write without the letter in e English or French, but... Uh, well done. Um, anyway, there's a thing called an anti-lipo, which is the inverse of that, where instead of leaving something out, uh, you kind of keep coming back and uh, referring to the same motif or the same word. Uh, in this case, uh, it is a word, and uh, see if you can guess what it is. This is called 27 grams, the weight of the world. The strippogram practised her routine while listening to her stereogram, a mocking echo of the light entertainment programme. Her grandmother, who reared her, used to listen via radiogram, while sat decoding the acrostic's crafty anagrams, unravelling its grammatical cat's cradlings, as intricate as the origami tangram she crafted, for she liked to keep her engrams active and live. How she always had to wait for her grammy to go out, dressed in her dowdy grogram skirt and matronly grammashes in order to attend lectures on Antonio Gramsci, to rebut his atheist hegemonic sociograms on her monogrammed notepaper. For only then could the girl switch to the phonogram function, wheeling around the parlour to Nick Drake and Graham Parsons, deprogramming her strict upbringing. A gramercy if once her guardian didn't return home early, feeling queasy from the implications of an angiogram. Finding her sign cavorting lewdly, she accused her of grammary, a tone as declamatory as if she dawned a bloody pentagram, taking in vain the spirit, if not the name, of the tetragrammaton. A thrown out on her ear to trop the isograms, making her way through the Grampian hills, the start of her three grams a day cocaine habit, six at weekends, oiling her roaring trade as a strippogram, as the oleaginous punters love to give her impromptu mammograms. Uh, this next one, again, is an example of um, one of those stories where just sort of looking at the central image and just turning it slightly, getting a new shade of meaning, a new insight. Uh, in this case, it was simply the uh, idea of, well, what if you've got a name badge, uh, but there's nothing on it? Your name isn't on it. And this is called Achy Breaky Purple Heart. Here's hoping. A lickety spit inspection to ensure I haven't tucked the back of my dress into my nicks or anything classy like that. A sharp intake of freshly minted breath. A crisp confirmatory nod bestowed in the direction of myselfhood. 
my name is, that's all it says on the tag, precisely that, dot dot dot, dash 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 dot dot dot, having been strangely omitted. No name and no pack drill. Nor have I been awarded the order of the twin purplish hearts that everyone else here seems to sport, where seemingly some thoughtful soul has limbed two interlocking hearts on the cardboard, pink tinging purple as the hues dissociate along its ply. Just in case one should look down at one's adapted shop office soiled visitor's pass and momentarily become befuddled as to where one was. A carbon life form dating society with the emphasis on form. For we, all of us here tonight, are being recycled. A job lot of pre-laminates, obviously. The badges, I mean. Even though everyone in attendance prays to be bonded and to have the past overlaid. First term, first name terms only. Rather than those of divorce settlements. Or no terms at all, as in my case. For no one at the door had a pen, and my eyeliner pencil was just too chubby to cut the mustard. Folded into this sterilised lucky dip, I've been shorn of my cover. In this unsanctified chapel of love, I've been dechristened. All because it was a bit of a rush. At the last minute, some shrinking violet faced with the prospect of being a wallflower, pollarded herself, and I, at the head of the reserve list, was requisitioned. Pinned on and hemlined up, pitter-patter, pitter-patter, uh, be still, my fluttering heart. Leave that to the eyelashes. Oh, well, you know what they say, in for a penny, in for a pound. Never has my stock been so low. Still, it does present somewhat of a problem as to how I tender myself to my fellow travelling love contractors, how I dovetail with these hawkers of the heart. The natural icebreaker of having my name stamped and barcoded plainly for all to perceive is in dry dock hock. A champagne of plenty has been flung at this prospective maiden relaunch. Frangible confidence shattered, my bottle long gone. The strangers in this flow do not pass me like ships in the night. They just proceed to give me, with my nebulous flag of inconvenience, a wide berth. Save for the catch with the bottle-thick spectacles. He who heaves to at each and every bobbing prow, now sidled into my Chanel awake. Pitching so close to my bosom, as to leave a vaporous spume on my nameplate, while he tries to focus his magnified sextant. For my part, I'm acquainted with the unmagnificent sex of his balding crown. Unable to pinpoint my heavenly being, he hoists up his specks so that they breast his forehead in a myopic attempt to pierce my anonymity. Now even he prepares to cast off, shaking his head foggily, which serves only to bring his glasses sliding down on the bridge of his nose. My escort scuttled before I even got out of port. As scanning the room, I see hands wrapped around tumblers of cheap, warm, bubbly, indexing fingers freed up so as to point at the swirls and loops on each other's badges. I can mark them trying out the sound of one another's handles, sipping at them with their lips, ingesting the consonants and swilling the rat vowels around inside their cheeks, showing the palate with the blend of conjoining the name with that of their own contemplating whether to imbibe or expectorate the vintage before them. You begin to see my problem, my unwritten invisibility. It seems I'm to be the undesignated driver for tonight. As they all give rip to their avid ferment, I'm reduced to smoothing a crinkle in my bodice, where the badge safety pin has rucked up the chiffon beneath. OK then, so I'm thrown back on my own resources. I have to be myself. But who am I? I have no accreditation. No, wait, go with it. Use it to my advantage. Here goes nothing. I know, these badges. The bubbly in hand is the only indication that this couldn't be an AA meeting. No, not the breakdown service. I don't know, no. That went well, I thought. An icebreaker, like the one applied to loosen up Leon Trotsky. This perishing no-name badge will be the dearth of me. If first it concede me any life amongst these love-lorn wraiths. I fluffed my line, for these could not be recovering alcoholics, since they are at least possessed of some spirit. This lot's more akin to um, a convention of call centre operators. Hello, Archie speaking. What, may I ask, is the nature of your inquiry? Maybe I just imagined I heard that for a chat-up line. Or perhaps they could pass for a group of personnel officers on a motivation course. 
Well, downsizing one's ambitions is an occupational hazard at this stage in life. If only the stakes weren't so great, how much more personnel could it get than those two interlaced hearts lovingly felt tit by some romantically deluded secretary from Cupidity Corp? Thinking about it, as I was so late in insertion, had my badge actually been attended to, it would probably have been after the secretary had knocked off for home, in readiness for an evening of pre-packaged ready meal, Mills and Boone pre-cooked intimacy, and a recorked bottle of Blue Nun, with an imitation carnation in her table vase. No, my heart's design would have indubitably been coined by the hostess Pandora herself, and more than likely it would have resembled a walnut. She's a busy lady after all, to judge by watching her crossing the room as she trifles with the most dirigible men here. Even my posies wilted now, it's not fair. Well, they've all moved on to the getting to know you stage, the apparel beyond the name, the flesh beneath the clothes, sizing up the jeans, imagine the look of mutually engendered babies. They stop nodding empathic assent to their partner's recitation of their history too distorting of glances slyly thrown towards the calculus of curvedness and homeness. My prospects here have been completely stunted by this one scandalous circumstance. Perhaps I should demand a refund. No, more than likely they'll stake me another date night instead. And even appropriately sanctioned, I think I'd rather share an evening round the dinner table of their secretary, swapping overblown notions about love. I bring the wine, though. Uh, and this last one um, just considers the notion of the spaces that we inhabit, our houses, and how, if you're there for a long time, that somehow the house takes on infusions and traces of the people who live there. This is called Two Up, One Down. It was our dream house. A white picket fence, hydrangea and bougainvillea, understated unassailability and overblown fecundity. The lot. Interiors designed by ourselves, hand-drawn plans, lofty elevations with the highest of intentions, carving out our shared space, and shutting the door on the world just to inhabit one another. Our abode, a place of constancy, of abiding bricks and mortar solidity, a uniquely private realm in which to abide by its own internal rhythms, if not its house rules. Are those windows kissed by the sun in the morning, the walls lived with shadows from the electric lights, our own projections. A place to bide time, until you can abide one another no longer. Once ineffable percolations of each has seeped into the tiny cavities in the masonry. A blisters of self, having bubbled the wallpaper and welted the paintwork. The very tissue of the house sweats. Colonisation by Eau de Cologne boy and Attar girl. Suffused with one another like blocked up paws, we sought to pop one another like blackheads. She's gone now, vacated this space, leaving me free to roam its walls, to restore and reconcile the fabric having been divorced from its design through hosting our conflict. For other than the one I may be located in, all rooms are now spare. I stand in the parlour with no one to talk to. I've wearied of shouting at events unfurling themselves on TV in order to make myself heard. It can't be deemed a lounge, since I find I cannot relax here. The sofa dwarves me in its spongy embrace. Nor does it merit the name of a reception, for though I've removed the rug where we like to fuck in front of a roaring fire, the bare floorboards only accentuate my lone tread. The fire, too, is playing up, suggesting sympathy is lying with her as it draws not through the chimney, instead choking the heart of the room with its fumes. Her geegaws, knick-knacks and trinkets, which were meant to be conversation pieces, are nothing of the sort, of course, since they only silently brook her side of the argument. So I swept them all from sills and mantle into a cardboard box and evicted them. The piano still stands there, even though I cannot play a note. Removal logistics have defeated me, since it is too outsized to squeeze back through the door. I have at least shut both its lids, so that its works do not mock me with their simulation of the idle bars of my typewriter keys upstairs. The kitchen never really was my prov province anyway. Its units being fairly neutral, it was the crockery and its ilk that were partisan. 
they've departed with the figurines. I don't utilise the oven, settling for nightly takeaways instead. However, the washer dryer presents me no such qualms, though opening its more to receive its incipient male-only minotaur's offering, it revealed a part undigested former ablation of one of her pop socks. In actuality, I have used the cooker once, the gas hob to ignite the sock and watch it shrivel and burn in the formerly stainless steel sink. Up the stairs, and one is confronted by the possibility for takeoff lying behind each closed door verging the landing. But it struck me that doors could either admit inward, ushering you in the room, or as you inclined forward to open them, they swung out and demanded you give ground before crossing their hallowed threshold. And if positioned within, the same dynamics in reverse. The door that opened as if trying to press you back inside the room, or that which swung out with you hanging on the handle almost being dragged out of it. We'd mounted all these doors ourselves, yet I'd been oblivious to the unspoken echelons implied by each one's loaded singularity. Needless to say, the master bedroom was nothing of the sort, opening inwardly and seeking to hold me there. A boudoir, her word, and means a place to sulk. How fitting! I tried aerosols, burning incense and leaving the windows open all day in order to purge the funk of her. The linen had been disposed of, but her sex still ruffled the room. I'd covered the mirrors with cloths until a drinking sage pointed out this is how Jews mark mourning. And then I contented myself with smashing them with a hammer, seven years bad luck being a small price to pay, even if they're cumulative sentences. I simply abandoned those clothes by removing the wardrobes festooned with broken glass. The bathroom was an unavoidably wretched strait. Both the medicine cabinet and the shower door had been her last direct communique with me, but I managed to wipe clean the hateful lipstick messages until all that remained were carmine smears like the trail of a squashed blood-sucking bug. Enhancing the room's locus of blood and dirt and skin, a labyrinth of hidden plumbing running down beneath plug holes and cisterns, with their curves and new bends for trapping our runoffs and effluvia. For all my rubber-gloved bleaching sorties, how she must still reside there, little tiny shards and spores of hair, nails and other offcuts, totems and clippings of her unsympathetic magic, cursing me from beneath the ruts and gouges in the linoleum. She persecutes me from within the pipes, blow darting me to a slow ruin. So it's hardly surprising that I've retreated to the sanctuary of my study. I've put a camp bed down, hang my few reclaimed clothes from the curtain tracks, and it's here I partake of my meals too. For this was ever the one single room stamped entirely with my cast. Though somehow her poisonous essence even manages to slip under the door and waft itself within these precious walls. I only return to writing by typewriter, because every time I switch my computer monitor on, there in lipstick font would appear the message, How can you live with yourself? No matter what I did to try and change my screensaver, always it would return afresh to taunt me. Somehow she had hardwired it into my system, and I didn't even know she could work a computer. So I jumped that, the only position of mine to disappear along with all of hers. Yet my own words have never since flowed beneath my fingers. The emotional integrity of my room, the refuge of my thoughts, had somehow been penetrated and my prowess was bleeding out. It wasn't those particular words themselves that were corroding me. It was the groundwork she put in and underlying them, when she had reconsulted our original ground plans for the house, and overwritten the word study in my angular uncial with the word nursery, and appended a heart above the U.